Namaste and in la catch and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host Zen Benefiel and as always you're probably tired of this but you're going to get it anyway. Namaste and in la catch are two ancient phrases that contain wisdom that we really need in our world today. Namaste comes from the Sanskrit spoken it's called Brahmi and it simply means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In La Ketch, from the other side of the world, the Mayan culture means I am another you. So imagine what it's like having that kind of outlook toward others when you're recognizing everyone you meet from that place. What a difference that can make in their life, in your life. Don't believe me, though. Test it. Find out for yourself. Great. All right. So this week's guest is Doug Brunke, and he is the founder and uh, executive director or, or um, head cheese for <laughs> nothing about Boar's Head, right, um, of the Global Chamber. Now, what they do is they use AI and warm connections to uh, connect exporters and investors, new clients across cities and borders, and they, they're already in 195 countries and 525 metropolitan areas. So he's really been doing some great work in connecting people and working towards peace too. Now, he has been around Arizona. We've known each other for probably maybe the 18 years since you've been here. Um, he And I really know that he's going to have some great things to say in our conversation today. Doug, thanks for being here. Namaste. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You know, it, a lot of times we get, you know, we just kind of jump into things. So doing so, you know, when you began this, you know, you, I know you got your MBA in, in Michigan, but before that, did you have an inkling of where your life was headed and, and where you were going and, and were there any kind of internal relationships that you developed early on in life and what were they like? Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah, the, the, um, I did get an executive MBA in Michigan State when I was working with the DuPont company in Troy, Michigan. I had been living in Japan and pretty much had had a number of years then doing international work. And I love international business. I've been doing it for 35 years. And I knew, you know, that's kind of my life calling. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that point, um, I would say uh, I knew I needed to do, to do international work. Uh, when I graduated from that, uh, from, from that experience, I actually went to Singapore um, and then continued kind of on, on, on that track. Uh, fast forwarding to where we are today, I, I, I did end up taking an early retirement from DuPont because along the journey, I started to do some consulting work and I realized I was pretty good at it and I really enjoyed it, but I wanted to stay international and ended up uh, working at a uh, consulting company doing international consulting uh, and and just was having having a blast traveling, helping companies be more successful. However, I, I I did feel like there was more to it, especially more to what I could provide. Um, especially when I came up with the idea of what I'm doing now, these last right. seven years, uh, the global chamber. I was in California. Uh, and had this vision of an organization, a chamber of commerce that was everywhere. Every chamber is in one city. And I had this thought that what happened, what would happen if we did a chamber of commerce that was everywhere? That would be really valuable and powerful and would really help people solve one of the fundamental issues around business is how do I build my business in other cities, not just in my own city? Right. And so that that all kind of took me on this journey of creating Global Chamber, and that's the one I've been on for seven years and, and having a blast. And so thank you for the opportunity of, of stringing it all together or helping me tell the story of stringing it all together to where we are today, helping companies do uh, international business. 
Sure, sure. And, and so with your permission, I'd like to unpack that a little bit and, and kind of go, go back to when, in, in your younger years, were, were there things that was going on in, inside of you that were kind of guiding you and, and maybe you didn't recognize it then, but you know, in hindsight's 2020, right? Or usually, uh, but were, are there some things that looking back that you recognize were um, road signs or that were guideposts or, or even um, experiences that you had that kind of began leading you in this direction? Sure. You know, when I think about kind of what are some of the real pillars in my life today, I think about my grandfather, who was my mentor. He, uh, at age 50, overheard his boss in Queens, New York, uh, tell someone else that Joe, my grandfather, wasn't going to be a partner in the business. And my grandfather, this was a machine shop in Springfield Gardens. When he heard that, he picked up his clothes and he left. Um, and, you know, took his mail, his lunchbox and went home to my grandmother, Emma, and said, Emma, we're in business. And, and at that point, my mother was 13 and my uncle was eight. So two kids and he had a steady paycheck. That was not well received by my grandmother Emma and so but basically they became entrepreneurs and you know long story short for for them he also then subsequently became a significant impact on my life I watched him become an entrepreneur a very successful entrepreneur age 50 through age 69 where he sold the business very successfully and was throughout that period and definitely even after that he lived into his 90s and my grandmother lived till 99. So I, they were very mm -hmm. impactful for me. So when I think about pillars, certainly that was, that was one. Um, their other pillars were never really global until later. That was an experience that I had to do on my own. Sure. Again, I, I saw that. I experienced it. It was amazing. It was what I, I was really good at and I really enjoyed and, and so that, that piece of it kind of came along the way. But well, my grandparents were certainly a, a, a key to establishing something that was important. But final, finally, I would say the, going into high school or finishing up high school, I guess, and going into college, sustainability was always a key part. The understanding that the world needed to be better, to be better balanced. And so, so... I wanted, I went to college with, as a meteorologist, believing that, okay, well, let me clean up the air at least. And so let me learn how to do that. After a few months, just practically speaking, I saw who the meteorologists were and they were kind of weird people, you know, based, <laughs> based on where I was going to school at University of Utah. So I, uh, I switched to chemical engineering because it was more broad based and more uh, full, full education, if you will. And mm -hmm. so, so ironically, me, Mr. Sustainability became a chemical engineer who worked for the DuPont company, you know, so, so, so that's even kind of that, oxymoronish or at least somewhat for a little while anyway. However, some, some there's still good that can be done. Yeah, it's, it's, it became, I think maybe another pillar in my life is understanding that there are these competing forces, you know, in the world. And, you know, uh, the green, when the, the flip side of that was as a DuPonter and watching Greenpeace climb a water tower in our plant, you know, it rec I recognize that there's extremism on all sides. And while I'm still an environmentalist and I also value what Greenpeace does, and, and, and sometimes extremism is required. In fact, many times extremism is required to make your point and make change that, that we need to live in this world and have uh, progress and have products and have development. And those things are important. And I, I, I believe they can be done sustainably. And so there is a path that we can have it all. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm, I agree. I'm, and... You know, to me, it seems that, and I, I frame it this way, that we're, we've kind of been under an agenda of profit over people and planet, right? And now we're beginning to switch to a people and planet over profit. 
doesn't do away with the profit because we still need to earn a living and, and be sustainable, right? It, but what it changes is how we interact with each other. You know, one of my first guests, Dr. Robert Gilman, talked about being in harmony with self, others, and the planet. And I, I think this is one of the things that we may have been missing in this uh, initially. Not that we did it purposely, because throughout the industrial age, you know, we were just moving forward at light speed, it seemed like, and not really thinking too far into the future. And I think our nature is only to, you know, look short term. Then we realized, oh, what we've done is actually having a long-term effect and, and we need to kind of begin to shift things. However, we were so far into it that it was nearly impossible, impossible to pull back from. And, and yet anything's possible. You know, you just have to have that extremist that comes forward and say, hey, look, you're doing stuff wrong. I mean, you need to go this direction. Now, that being said, how do you, and with the, uh, the notion of the global chamber, in the development of, of more sustainable environments and, and better working conditions and a, a greater harmony among people and planet and how we're addressing each other in the environment, how, how, how do you see that as the timeline that's been happening and have you seen it evolving What's your perspective of that? Because you've got a much different one coming from the world that you have and being in the position you are, which is rare, right? I, I, and I really appreciate you being able, being able and willing to come talk to me. Uh, so have, have you seen a progression in, in a change or at least a noticeable one that looks like it could be trending? Well, the, the world is getting better, you know, and I think, uh, one of the things, if you haven't, uh, you probably have read Hans Wrestling, but but maybe some in the audience haven't. Definitely check out his work. He's passed away a few years ago, but the work that he's done in tracking the last two hundred years of health and wealth, you know, the 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 point that he made over and over again is people think the world is getting worse. It's actually quite the opposite, dramatically opposite. That it's getting way better. And, and we see things on kind of in, a, in the short term that seem like things are worse or we're told things are worse. <laughs> yeah, we and get the these narratives people. that kind of drill this, drive it into us and, and yet we're not able to step back and, and look beyond that. Right. Say, no, wait a minute, let's look around here and, and see, you know, we're being told that there's scarcity and lack and, and things of that nature. And right. actually when you pull back and look around, that's not true. And like yeah. you say, it is getting better. There's systems in place that never used to be. There's distribution. There's, you know, the monitoring of the economy is now based on the movement of um, cargo, right? And how many ships are on the ocean and how much uh, of the cargo containers are on them. Well, and it goes beyond just like those kinds of kind of things. It's, it's, the, it's how long people are living. You know, take a look at just how long. Absolutely people are living and how fewer wars people are dying from, from less people are dying from war. Of course, now there's always a war, you know, and if you're in a war, it seems like, you know, things are getting much worse, right? So, so Absolutely. that's definitely understandable, but, and there is always, and there are always people who have, want to have that worldview that things are getting worse. And they have a whole channel. It's called Fox News. They get to go there and make, feel really bad about the world, that people are taking stuff from them and all of that. That's, that seems to go on. It's not just in the U.S., but in every country, there's like that group of people who want to hear about things being taken from them and how bad things are and then politicians use it you know to right. try to get it's, them a, it's to this vote. aggressiveness that has been used and even howard bloom goes into it uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier in his book uh, the lucifer principle it, it's a scientific study of history of how a few people through controlling media and telling lies affect masses entire populations yep. and they're building off of that fundamental fear that you know and it's a fear you know which which absolutely. goes to kind of like 
how I view the world is that the most important thing of all things is education. And a part of education is not just getting an education, but travel, you know, go places, experience what other people go through. It's so critical. And that's part of the reason why I started Global Chamber was not just tactically to help businesses grow, which is kind of what we do every day, mm -hmm. finding clients for, for businesses, but my own belief and knowledge that within the people that do this work, we are, I call it being enlightened. You know, it's an enlightenment that comes through dealing with other people, but just doing trade. Uh, it was Montesquieu from France who had a quote about trade, that trade creates goodness in the world because if you're going to trade with someone you've got a product and you got to build trust there there's a yeah you have to adjust you have to be flexible you have to, you can't be rude you can't be angry you can't you can't do certain you can't shoot the other person you know it doesn't because right. they can't pay you i mean you can take their money but it's not gonna from a long-term perspective be a very sustainable model so to have a a sustainable trade model you've got to have people who are educated you've got to have people who get along with each other you've got to have people who can overcome intercultural issues an example of, of, of that very a simple one is one I was using yesterday in a conversation where the Malaysians versus the Swiss I love both cultures I love all I love all cultures but the Malaysians tend to be very um family oriented and so uh contrast that with the swiss of course they love family as well except if if i'm a swiss and i my brother tells me in confidence that he's cheating on his taxes if i'm swiss i'm very likely going to report him to the authorities <laughs> you know i love my brother but i love authority and i love the rules just you got to be a good human, more. in other words. And, and if you're not, we're going to bring it up. You know, speaking of being a good human, we were talking that would about... That very unusual in Malaysia to happen. If 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 I'm uh, my brother in Malaysia would tell me something like that, I almost would never do that. Does that make someone from Malaysia unethical? Or it's certainly different, I would say. And I think one of the characteristics of when you're doing global business is you become a lot less judgmental. You know, you sure. become recognizing that, hey, we're all in this together, cultures are different, and by understanding culture and valuing culture and uh, valuing the differences, I'm going to do trade better. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and that's part of kind of that worldview that you started out by asking, you know, how do you, how, where is your, what are your pillars? My pillar is not in religion. It's not, you know, in something like those kinds of things, although I would probably be more spiritual and maybe more Buddhist, even though I'm, you know, originally a Christian. Um, I, I think there are fundamentals within each one of those religions that teach us what right and wrong is, certainly, and maybe what integrity could be, you know, in terms of a definition. But ultimately, I think my, my, my North Star is trade. If we can do trade together, then, you know, everybody's happy. You know, and we can, we can make money, we can, we can dance, we can sing, we can eat together, we can raise a family, we can, we can have money for education, we can be sustainable because the more people then with education, you know, we're going we're gonna to have a better future. So, so those are some of the key areas that, that we certainly focus in on global chamber and that are that are basic tenets of what keeps me going on a daily right. basis if that makes sense absolutely does and very practical and pragmatic sense it makes now you know there's a, a growing community and there's lots of people who have gone through let's say spiritual awakenings i was actually going to ask you if, if you had actually gone through a type but and as I was thinking about that question, you started talking about, you know, it's really about trade. It, it's about being your best self, showing up and doing what's right. And that's a gut feeling that everybody can relate to. You're talking about getting along, making sure that you're both taken care of, that building trust, building relationships, uh, being good humans. 
right? And that, that's what I, you know, I found that recently I got involved with the Live and Let Live Global Peace Movement. And their premise is twofold. There's a legal and a moral side. The live is based on non-aggression, right? And, and which we have a lot of and have been dealing with. That's one of the things as we've grown globally that there are some aggressive um, things going on. I'll put it that way. And, and aggressive people in the process. Now, that is part of the change that's taking place, especially when you're involved with trade and especially international trade and being able to, to get along and do things and work through all this stuff because bottom line is you want to work with each other in, in order to build your businesses, right? So there's certain things that whether you're metaphysical or spiritual or religious, doesn't matter because it's how you live and how you show up in every relationship that's most important. And you find that that's essentially what's happened in your building of the the global chamber and you're dealing with trade now at the end of the day if you're able to do business with someone it means that you've communicated properly you you have the right honesty for them to you know commit to you know purchasing from you if you will or vice versa that that you've 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 created a relationship based on certain levels really it's a moral to some degree it's a moral exchange mm -hmm. that allows that to all happen and and i and i think for me it's been again a, a north star to be able to guide my own life i've been uh you know the uh, the christian route and you know tried the you know the born again piece and uh i was just it was just horrific it was just terrible i it wasn't right for me at all and when i went to college I, in retrospect, realized what happened. I, I went from New York to Utah and got away because I something mentally to me was like, I've got to get away and sort through this. And I you went from the Jewish community or, or Russian Jewish community to the Mormon community. Which I did. I honestly, I didn't even know in Utah yeah. what Mormons were. I, I, yeah. I only chose Utah because it had a science, a variety of science. It had a meteorology department, but it also had other studies that I could do and then my dad and I showed up on a February morning or actually an evening and we we woke up in the morning and we got out uh, it was some hotel on on North Temple and I honestly I had no idea even what the Mormon church was and we got out and it was it had snowed the night before and it was blue sky and I got out and I looked at the city and like and I saw these white hills without trees right in Salt Lake and thought now, are those salt piles? Like I couldn't, my head could not, being grown up in upstate New York, I couldn't figure out what that was. And it just sort of blew me away. Like, oh my God, this is like some unbelievable place. And so between- You just, you just visited the moon, right? No, it was, was, where I'm was sitting, you're looking was, at something different. It was, it was so different. And then seeing the university and how different it was, I thought, wow, this is the place, you know, it's sort of like, a, <laughs> you know, the, the, this is the place monument that uh, Joseph Smith, uh, it was, I think Joseph Smith said when he came down Immigration Canyon, it was like, this is, this is our place. And that was my yeah. place for different, different, you know, reasons. So, so I, it took me though, many summer nights kind of sorting through my head, what I had been through and through the religious experience and through growing up in somewhat of a dysfunctional family to get, and then meeting my wife, quite honestly, who was a Greek, Greek Orthodox, where the Greek Orthodox, if you're Greek, you're Greek Orthodox. It's like, right. there's very, and you, the word you used there that I really related to was very pragmatic and, 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 you know, Hey, I'm going to marry this woman, which I ended up doing almost 40 years ago. I'm going to become a Greek Orthodox. I'm going to be, or I'm going to become, you know, her husband. I'm going to be Greek Orthodox. It's a transaction. <laughs> you know, it's there, there's it's trade. To right? <laughs> and, and but it's a trade up, right? That's kind of the way it worked out. So yeah. it's so, so I, I love that idea that, and in fact, the Greek, the Greek Orthodox Church has been very helpful when people have died you know, in our life to be supportive, right? That to me, the church has been amazing in terms of 
the fathers who have been so supportive as her folks died and how her brother died and during times of turmoil, I've never really needed personally, you know, in terms of like the, the church. However, you know, through those periods of times, all of us have needed something, you know, right, to, to help us through those periods. So Absolutely. anyway, I don't know if that was maybe beyond where you wanted to go with that, but but for me, all through all of that, eventually finding the trade aspect and finding something I really love to do really has kind of kept me going without the need for any real kind of religious support. Mm -hmm. Well, and and again, back to the practical and pragmatic, you know, I, I just remarried a few years ago to a, a wonderful woman from St. Petersburg, Russia, who is a Russian Jew. Um, wow. Again, practical, pragmatic, will, you know, she tells you what, what's on her mind and whether you want to hear it or not and that was refreshing so refreshing to me because in my history and maybe yours to some degree as well people are reticent to be to fully show themselves for whatever and it's usually fear or insecurity you know you, you're trying to build a relationship you don't want to, you don't want to let people see everything about you and yet that transparency is what's really required, even in trade, where well, you're dealing and with people true. and you're getting to know each other. Yeah, and I think part of that is why I've excelled. Like during this period of time, I just became very comfortable with myself in the sense of being very customer centric. Um, I've always been that way, probably growing up in my grandfather's shop in Queens of, you know, whatever, you know, asking questions and trying to find solutions. And so when I showed up on my first, you know, trip overseas to South Korea, to Busan, I visited the Hyundai company and the suppliers of Hyundai. I was just thrown into the situation where they're, they're asking for help for products, you know, to like rubber and plastic products. That's where I kind of was involved with the DuPont company. And, you know, I just kind of went along with it. And so when they, when I was on the, my first trip, I was on the Hyundai assembly line in Ulsan, South Korea. And they were asking me for help on various things. I, you know, I didn't know anything like that. So now I had to break things down in terms of kind of the scientific method and asking questions and just trying to figure out what the problems were. And I, was able to solve enough problems for them to ask me back. So that, that, that was kind of cool. But that experience for them, I guess, was positive enough. And certainly for me was like, sure. wow, this is fantastic. This is, this is my calling. This is what I love to do. And so that really kind of was the kind of my, uh, the beginning of the end, <laughs> if you will, and the beginning of a, a future that, uh, that ended up as the global chamber and hopefully I can continue to be involved for 20 or 25 years or however long I, I can. Sure, sure. Now you mentioned the, the process, the scientific method you used in the process of asking the questions to determine really what was going on. And, and oftentimes I find maybe you can validate this when you're asking the right questions, the solutions appear. Right. And it, they're just, a, they make sense. They're a logical, you know, you're like you're on the, the logic train and, and it's, it just lays it out because you're yeah. asking the right questions. Now, if we could unpack that a little bit, what are those, especially in trade, what are the best questions that you've found that help to move a relationship forward or to, and you can even bring, uh, or could talk about problem solving as well. Sure. Uh, what do you find are the best questions to ask or, or the best methods to ask those questions with? Yeah. So uh, let, let me, before I, before I forget, I, I do want to make this point that when, because religion isn't important to me and because, you know, I've experienced a lot of it in, in different ways and I work very hard to try to make it work. Um, I'm not dissing religion. Um, I'm what I'm what I'm I believe that we all need something right to 
to believe in and then to, to ground us. And, and particularly when we go through really hard times, like a death of someone very close to us, yeah. um, those are times when, you know, we really got to dig down and have friends and have something mm -hmm. beyond ourselves. Right. So, so I, I, I didn't believe... get that from you as you were saying that I, I understood okay. where you were. I, I want to make sure that that's yeah. clear. Um, and so, you know, so when I see people who are very religious, um, I, you know, hey, I get it. You know, it's much better than being an alcoholic, you know, and, <laughs> you know, right? There are other, cru there are crutches that we use in life that are d dangerous and, and bad. Sure. And the fact that people, whatever their, whatever stage in life they are, you know, God bless them, you know, let, you know, do, do what, whatever it takes and help other people through that process. So, so right. that was, I wanted to make sure that, that, that I had made that clear. So Thank the you. questions you ask um, uh, vary depending on um, what you're trying to do. You know, the questions I ask now that always work are, um, who do you want to meet to grow your business? You know, so a lot of what we question people on is, you know, where are you taking your business and who is a, who is a good who is the best person for you to meet? Because very often when you ask people, well, who do you want to meet? They say, well, everybody's my customer and it's men. Yeah, and like trying to figure out a target market, right? They're everybody's a customer, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's that basic fundamental thing. It's like, oh, okay, so everyone. So, so anybody speaking any language, oh, no, 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 really just English. So, like, so it's a series of questions that narrow things down for people. And I would say generally, 80% of people still haven't kind of figured out that basic concept um, of just kind of making sure that you, you, you're, you're targeting the right person uh, and the right problem, you know, and, and it comes down to not just the person, right? It's the problem. And that evolves, right? I was just mm -hmm. on the phone with uh, one of our members and they've been a member for a couple of years. This is the third year they're renewing. And I said, well, what kind of what's what's evolved and how have you refined your target plus customer? And it was like, oh, great that you asked that question. You know, we've been through a process and now we have a strategic, you know, chief strategy officer. And there she is trying to teach us that we used to solve many problems now we've learned that we there are certain problems that we're really good at and we want to be able to solve more of those on a regular basis and so so part of what's happening of course is that companies and people are evolving so there's that piece in the beginning all of us start with everybody you know it's like oh i'll solve that i'll do that I, you know, i'll find you know, if you'll pay me some money i'll do that you know and then as time goes on we get better at refining what we're really good at. And certainly with Global Chamber, you know, that's the case. So it, so, so going back to your question, you know, what are, what are some good questions? I think, who do you want to meet? How can we help you? And then how can we help you can be a big question. So a lot of people probably won't answer that probably properly. So you've got to kind of then dig down however they respond to, to really dig down how can I help this person? And, and that's where the scientific method is. I, I do try to teach that to our own people around the world. And we have a, a teaching process to do that. It's not obvious to everybody. If you're an engineer, very often you've been kind of taught that in college to some level. However, even that you know, was not necessarily true. I think if you ask that basic question and get finally to the answer of, how can I help that person? Then you've got the process down right. Right, right. And, and I, I understand exactly where you're, where you're coming from with that. The similar side I see of it, um, I helped develop a, a business plan writing curriculum and, and taught it for a micro lending organization back in the early 2000s. And in so we would bring uh, women and minority owned business owners um, in and, and of course, they wouldn't have a business plan. You know, what is it? 80% of businesses don't have a business plan. And so when they begin writing these things and going through the structure, uh, even with the target market, you know, the, they start with, oh, everybody. And then you start drilling down and asking the questions to, you know, who, what's your company? What do you do? What's your purpose? What's your vision, mission? 
and who do you really serve and, and how do you serve them? And yep. so, you know, that begins to narrow down the demographics and even the psychographics of your target market. Now, to be able to then zero in as a laser focus and serve those, that's really the goal of, of the entire business plan process, in my opinion. Well, it, it goes back to sustainability, right? How do you build a sustainable model? Well, serving right. everybody for every problem is not sustainable. So, so what problems are you gonna solve and then who are you gonna solve them for? I, I think it's okay not to have a business plan. That was something that kind of blew my mind when I heard about that concept 10 or 12 years ago. I, I couldn't imagine you know, having grown up in the corporate world, not having a business plan, but there's a guy in town um, whose name is escaping. Uh, Hamid Shojai is his name. With a, he's, got, he's a serial entrepreneur. Okay. Uh, the first company was Axosoft. And he, was, he got up at a global chamber event and said something to that effect that, you know, you don't, don't tell me about a business plan. Just solve problems, and it'll right. it'll become self evident. And and oh, I but that's honestly, for that, that's a unique individual that that's kind of in his DNA, where yeah. most people <laughs> need to have a process to focus that in. And man, if we could all be like that and, and yeah. just problem solvers, wouldn't that be great? I um, think you're right. I think a part of it is is that. However, the the part that he talks about about solving a problem, I totally agree. Right. Always yeah. know what problem you're solving, and recognize if you're um, if you're solving a problem and and you're doing it well, that people will buy from you and they'll start to come for you. And so with Global Chamber, you know what our problem was solved. The solve problem we were solving was how do I find clients in cities other than my own? You know, whether if I'm in Phoenix, how do I find them in San Diego? And then how do I find them in Tokyo or Moscow? 85% of business in the next five years is outside the U.S. And so if I'm, if I'm really going to be sustainable, why wouldn't I want to get clients there? And if, if I'm in Phoenix and I can't get clients in San Diego, what right would I have to think I could get them in Seoul or Moscow or Paris? So, so that was kind of the problem of how do we make business across metros and across borders as easy as selling across the street? And so, so we started out with that kind of basic premise of let's find ways to solve that problem. And so by asking the questions and by connecting people to people around the world, through having people in those places and knowing people in those places, we started to solve that problem on a regular basis. One of the first ones, by the way, that we solved really was very instrumental in our early development. It was a, a customer in uh, Kathmandu, Nepal, who wanted to sell their products in Dubai. And that was significant because it didn't have U.S orientation at all. It was just us supporting kind of from the outside and then our team in Nepal and our team in Dubai. And we ended up helping, you know, that person because uh, they were kind of lost. And we gave them five connections out of, and out of that they had four meetings when they visited Dubai and they got two clients out of it. And so the, the questioning, the processes, the connectivity be, and having that be successful was a kind of a monumental step for us in our development. And that now it's something is not bad at all. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it was, it was inspiring for many, for many reasons. That was kind of in year one. And now we just try to do that on a regular basis, pretty much everywhere. Hmm. Good. Now let's look into the future a little bit and, and how, do you see the methodology that you're using trickling out into the the communities that you're in and affecting them? You know, we were both talking about, you know, the, we really want to have a peaceful world and, and a lot of that can be accomplished tr through trade, right? And, and maybe most of it, because that's really the, the lifeblood of the planet is moving products and services right? and serving people and solving problems. So do you, how do you see that spilling out into the local environments? Sure. Well, you, the, the, the first part of your question about kind of what are we doing to kind of facilitate that, to be able to kind of take that next step from that example I gave between Nepal and Dubai, we need to be everywhere. 
So what I spend my days doing is finding people who are well connected everywhere in the world who can lead a chapter and be a, a beacon of hope, if you will, that mm -hmm. are roots within these communities so that we can give them this methodology and they can give us who the people are so that they build a chapter, the people that are enlightened enough to want to sell across cities, whether it's even from Accra, Ghana to Djibouti or, or into Nairobi or, or into France, where, wherever they want to grow, at least there's a mentality that I'm not setting up a nail salon in my own community and selling to people within a two block region. I, I want to do something different. I want to do something. And this bad. is an so, expanded view of the possibilities. It's, it's to be able to think that way is is a revelation in and of itself, right? To sure. to take to have society think that that might be possible is is awesome. So what we have to do is build that network. We have a database of over a hundred million people, so we need to sort through that through using artificial intelligence. And so there's a technology involved to be able to make connections, and so that's what we're doing to help facilitate. Uh, all of that, when people start to see it happening, it's very exciting because I, I, on a reinforcement level, on a daily basis, I get people saying, wow, I love being part of the global tribe. One of them, it reminds me of a couple of quotations just a week or two ago, we had a meeting and one of them, one of the women said, whenever I'm in a global chamber meeting, I get my, my, optimism about the human race gets restored <laughs> and it's like wow <laughs> you know how did that happen and then well, yeah and, and that's important we we all need to have that optimism restored especially now coming out of this pandemic and you know the notion and the narrative that's kind of gotten us to be afraid of each other first of all and keep our yep. distance right and so now we've got to figure out okay how can we get close again how do we flip this effort and, and turn it back inward, if you will, and learn how to get along with each other well enough to establish these trade routes and, and trade opportunities and, and relationships that then, you know, just simply because of the relationships, do you find that, that like you say, there's this restored optimism? You know, I, the one woman, you know, bless her heart, you know, brought it up, but not everybody speaks their mind like that. Is there, do you have a sense that that's actually what's happening through this next phase or, or is it far enough along to where you can see it yet? Or you know, it, it's happening every day. So we, right. we did over 500 events last year and we'll do over 600 this year. And I can see in the meetings and in the interactions and then the introductions that happen and the conversations and the feedback that the trade is happening, right? And and it's across borders, and it's and it just it's just reassuring. And I think that's how I've never heard. By the way, in that particular meeting, it was that lady, and then there was another lady who's Bank of America. She said something very similar about you know having you know restoring her faith in humans as well. That that really um, reassured me that we're on the right track. You know, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, I don't know if it's the, the answer, and I'm not sure there is anything that is the answer, but I know that when people are trading with each other, they don't want to kill each other because, right. you know, as soon as you start doing that, then people who like, you know, you, you've got to trade in the, in the works and somebody dies, then, then how's, how the money's going to transfer, right? Like right. there's, right. If you, you uh, Thunderbird has a saying that, countries that trade with each other don't require soldiers, you know, on the border. And, and the whole concept of like, we're living in Arizona, but there's an entire political party. When I watch their commercials, I wonder what in the world, like what, it, what is going through you, the marijuana that you're smoking or whatever is your problem. There's one particular a nauseating commercial I've been watching on television in, in Arizona that's like, it's all about the border. It's like there's a war going on and they're attacking us. It's like, what in the world? You're nuts. You're absolutely nuts. Get 
trading with each other. We yeah. should want Mexicans into the U.S. We and have they really them. ever been to the border? There's no war there. You know, it, one of the nuts. One it's of the, crazy. It's it, just like it really it's, is. it's an alternate reality that doesn't exist. And why are we doing that? You know, I I try to tune it out. It's really hard. My wife actually turns the volume down. Hard to when it's in your face like that, isn't it? it? It's very hard. So we turn it down the volume, but it worries me that there's still people that are thinking that way and that are attracted to that thought process that people are trying to take something from them. It's and so so what keeps again me back going, to the aggression. People are programmed that aggression is okay. And so because they've been aggressed, they feel they can be an aggressor, and we haven't really addressed that. We we have to some degree in educate. You know, you mentioned that you know the commerce, the education, community are the three pillars of, of which our world is going to change. Yep. And by being able to establish consistent relationships and, and protocols and methodologies and systems that bring this commerce, education, community together in a synergistic way, then that optimism that we spoke of earlier is going to rise to the surface because that's what happens. People feel good about what's happening because they don't feel like they're being aggressed. They don't feel like they're being separated. They feel like they're being supported and, yep. and even safer by doing so. You know, we were talking about the border at, at in uh, 2014, uh, one of my hats is uh, I do partnering workshops for building road and bridge constructions. And one of those was, I uh, was hired by Homeland Security to facilitate a meeting in building the next uh, centralized processing center in McAllen, Texas. And what this was for was in 2014, 52,000 unaccompanied alien youth kids crossed the border there and they were from central and south america and most of them were kids that were in cartel affected areas that their parents said hey we you need a better life right and so off they went and with fifty two thousand crossing the border we don't even consider what that might be like and they didn't have the facilities to support that so next year they put together a plan and, and they built a facility to do so still we don't realize that our social or not uh, social security, but our social system then is backed up because the kids come in, they're processed, and within 72 hours, they're placed in either foster home or, or group homes. And we don't even know that that's going on. And yet, well, this, this gets this, you're, you're talking um, to uh, on a really important point that I think gets lost all the time. So thank you for bringing that up. You know, uh, I'm a chemical engineer. So chemical engineers, the thing about us is that we think in systems, mm -hmm. and, you know, like if you're going to build a refinery and you don't think about systems and process control, it blows up. You know, it, it's you, you just, you know, that's what happens. And so literally I think <laughs> people with a process view recognize that there's an ecosystem that's out here and you've got to not just treat a problem like where the problem is. There are reasons why those problems exist. And a great example is the one you're kind of referring to, which is, for instance, Central Americans coming into the U.S. Well, if we haven't addressed the problem in their home, if we, for instance, remove the aid, the foreign aid on that side and not and not giving them an opportunity to live their life there and be bullied by folks, they're, guess what's going to happen? They're going to leave that place. They're going to look for something to survive, and they're going to leave. So you can't, on the one hand, say we're going to take foreign aid away because we, we, we that money needs to come here, and then you know you know, kill people as they're coming across the border. It's illogical. It's, it's absolutely. It's, it just it's, doesn't make sense at all. Yeah, that that and that's I think. And especially for a nation that it was built on Christianity. I'm, I'm sorry? And I said, especially for a nation that was built on Christianity. Yeah. Well, then that's a whole other thing. How could right. how could Christians behave in the way <laughs> we've seen them behave? I, I have no idea. And it's one of the reasons why I, you know, I don't really kind of categorize myself that way because sure. I... I feel like the there's there's people wandering the world 
that haven't really come to grips with themselves. And that's why I told the story about me in college. I, I, in retrospect, recognize that I process a lot of stuff in my head about why Christianity didn't work for me and other issues that I had in my life. I processed that a lot on my own, but then finally met a woman who was amazing and is amazing. We're just about right. to be married for 40 years, and she's solved a lot of those problems. Fast forward, though, to this Christmas, you know, and not probably giving out too much information, but, but my daughter wanted me to go to a therapist with her. <laughs> she's, been, she's been dealing with some things in her life, and so she wanted the three, she and That's I, amazing that uh, she even asked you. Well, I think it, it was great, right? And I, and I, well, I was like, of course, I love the heck out of you. So I, of course, I'm going to do that. So what came out of that was that, you know, I recognized that there were things my parents did to me that I didn't want to transfer down into the chain, right? I didn't, I, I worked very hard not to do that to my daughter, but I did some of that to my daughter. And some of that came out in the therapy, which I've now, she's got me going to a therapy. You know, in Scottsdale, recognizing well, you know, parenting has no manual, right? We do it the best. Generally, we do it the way we learn from our parents, the good, bad, or ugly, right? And, and so we promote that until there's that aspect of, oh, wait a minute, kind of like we're talking about the scientific method, it's the same thing applied. What can I do best here to serve the need of the moment? Not what I want, not what she wants or he wants, but what's best for it to happen. And, and which leads me to the question I wanna ask you. So even though there's this non-religious affiliation, I get that. Have you had experiences where you've been questioning something and, and all of a sudden you have this aha moment or this um, interconnectedness or, or maybe even a voice in your head, uh, something that, that seems out of place and yet feels natural. Do you have those kinds of things? Because it would seem to me with the level of activity that you're having, that that would be a natural part of the process, not necessarily something you'd often talk about. So I appreciate the, the you know vulnerability and being able to, to talk about it if you so choose. But do those kinds of things happen? And, and what are those like? Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, probably through the deaths in my life of people that were very significant, those were all you know, I'd say at least a half a dozen of those were traumatic and, and, and important, like my father being with my father, his last six or eight hours and being just alone from like midnight to uh, about seven in the morning and just holding his hand and then having him pass away. Those, that experience or my grandfather committing suicide, the fellow that I mentioned earlier about mm -hmm who um, finally, you know, took his own life the, a few weeks after I went on my first international trip. So here I was pouring my guts out, like I found my, my place in life. I, you know, thank you for all your mentorship. You're amazing. I love you and you're great. And then, then he commits suicide. It's like, oh my God, you know, that, that's an experience that took me decades Oh yeah, because that doesn't make sense, right? Because yeah. you don't, but you don't know what's inside his head, or or you know what emotional turmoil he had been going through, or something like. It. But it's funny, you know. He's, uh, you mentioned he was a machinist. That that's how I started out too. I worked for a research here in the valley. Um, when uh, machinists tend to have a high suicide rate for some reason, I heard that oh, some time ago. Yeah. Uh, because of the stress, you know, the tolerances, the the perfectionist, right? And, and when you're holding, you know, for me, I had three or ten thousandths of an inch, millionths of an inch tolerances I had to hold. I loved it. But I could see guys around me that it just drove them batty because it, it was so much pressure. Got it. I think with him, it's like it has been transferred to me. It's, it's, it's a desire to to have an impact, to have, mm -hmm. um, to not ever feel like, you know, 
the, the life of Arizona that people retire and are out on the golf course, that is not me. I could never be that person. I like to have fun and I have a lot of fun, but I- And you do play golf though. I, you can play golf and have fun. And then the next day, you know, impact somebody and, and help yep. them improve. And so yep. I feel like I've had enough life experiences and I know what questions to ask that I can train other people to do that, you know, so I can kind of multiply the impact. Sure. You, well, as a leader, that's your job basically is to create replacements. Yeah. Which, which I don't think I fully answered earlier in terms of kind of like, how does that work? the impact that we can have and have people say things like what, what I mentioned earlier means that we've had an impact on them where they see that a certain style or a certain approach works, like asking questions, mm -hmm. you know, like doing trade, like being honest in your interactions with people and being you know, quite transparent so that people trust you enough to be able to do work. You know, those, those are certain things that I think are really important to, to, to communicate. So, so going back to your question about like, you know, what, what are those uh, connecting points? You know, for me, you know, when we do trade, like um, an example would be maybe in Indonesia where earlier in my career, where I was probably closer to that quote unquote Christian person that I was kind of evolving away from, um, Indonesia made me a little uncomfortable because it was so foreign, if you will, quote unquote foreign. Right. But my last trip there was was like heaven. It was like, oh my God, like the 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 call to prayer like at one in the morning or something at a, a temple right next door to the hotel was so soothing to me. It was so so otherworldly and so amazing in terms of its impact on me. I just thought it was amazing you know it go, goes back to what i said about whatever religion you know it does to me it doesn't really matter having that connectivity to something you know can be very satisfying and important and and you know along the way you know whatever that ends up being however you know however people choose to do it mm -hmm. so yeah, for me you notice that in the the process how often do you notice the synchronicities that take place and what you're looking for and what shows up and how it shows up. Yeah, every day, you know, with every deal, with every trade and with every problem, right? You know, normally, like when you're doing a trade, you know, everything is fine in the beginning, but what happens along the way is challenges and problems. And an example of that would be um, a deal that we we inspired it, actually a Scottsdale company to, a telemedicine company to, to do business in Argentina. And it seemed like a very natural thing and a month or two after we made the introduction, I got a text from Argentina saying, why did you introduce me to these people? <laughs> I was like, uh-oh, that's a problem. So, so we got on a WhatsApp or whatever the technology was uh, yeah. and, and found out that you know, there's a problem. I called the CEO in Scottsdale and said, hey, there's a problem. He didn't know anything about it. They, we ended up kind of facilitating kind of a, uh, a, 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 a re-evaluation of what was going on and they sorted through it over a number of weeks and they finally ended up sorting through it. Two people got fired in Scottsdale because they weren't listening, you know, and then yeah. ultimately they became the number one telemedicine company in Argentina because they sorted through it. So, so those are, you know, across cultural, across, you know, whatever religion, you know, there, there is there, we solve problems. And when that happens, it's, it's, it's a reinvigorating moment, a reestablishing of the human spirit that we can accomplish things, you know, whether it's a deal like that, or whether it's clean tech, or whether it's whatever the problem is, we can solve this thing you know, together, if we, if we get our heads together. And so, I mean, I don't think it's any more complicated than that. I would agree. To get it to that simplicity is a very complicated process. <laughs> Probably it is. Yeah. Right? And, well, you've been through it enough times. I, I mean, I, I'm sure that, you know, that it's a complex initially and, until you understand the elements of the process, being a systems guy, Right, yep. you break it down into those elemental pieces that have to be in place in order for it all to work. Like you just mentioned, the the guy in Argentina calls up and says, "Hey, 
you know, why, what's going on here? And, and so they weren't talking to each other to begin with for whatever reason, or maybe one of these two guys, you know, was the gatekeeper or, or the bottleneck. Obviously the, they both were, if they got fired and things then got redirected, you had a conversation, the, the conflict that was thought to have been there turned out to be maybe just miscommunication. And that once that miscommunication was rectified, everything began to flow again. And, and this is one of the things I find so inherent in human dynamics is that uh, a, a mentor of mine said this long ago, uh, and you may even know him, Jerome Landau. Um, he's a lawyer here in, in Phoenix, and, and I've known him for 30 some odd years, one of the first people I met here. He said he's a uh, was president of the Association, Association for Al Alternate Dispute Resolution. There, I got it. And uh, the Aikido master or black belt. And, and he says, you know, there really is no conflict. There's just miscommunication. People who come to the table, they're speaking and listening from different dictionaries. No. If they're listening at all, you know, they may be trying to listen, to listen, but they're listening from a different perspective than the person who's speaking. And so you really have to understand, you know, develop this communication process that it may seem arduous, and yet it is imperative if you really want to establish a long-term relationship. Yeah, you have to have an open mind for sure. You can't go into it saying, well, people with skin colors of this are inferior or people who are, you know, you can't go into it judgmentally yeah. by having those questions asked from a clear perspective, you know, you get to the bottom of, of stuff. And so I totally agree with what, what you're saying. I think the problem is that whether it's, you know, an example of this would be in the marketing field. I, one of the surprises for me always is that like, it feels like 80% of marketers can't market because they're so wrapped up in their own head, especially when you're young, right? You're so wrapped up in all the things about you that it's hard to get your head into like a product going yeah. after a market because you are wrapped up into all of your thought process. You can't take your thought process and leave your body and be empathetic, you know, about someone else's life situation. Well, but that's the cure. Or, Marketing, sales, advertising, education even. You've got to understand your audience first. You've got to know how they're listening, what language they're listening in. You know, it, 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 it may be English, but there's all forms of English when you're talking about emotional intelligence, right? And, and so with that kind of, of mindset, I don't want to say mindset because it, it eliminates the possibilities, I think, you know, mindset, it's like it's concrete. Mind flow, maybe. When you're able to allow your mind to flow and you create environments with psychological safety and intellectual humility, then you have the opportunity pr to progress because you're in a much more open space to allow things to happen. That you're way. not defensive. You're not, you know, you're all of that other stuff that uh, happens when you're young, right? you very often when you're young, if I would have done a lot of what I've done now in my college years, it would have been a disaster because I was just a mess. You know, I was just like, I'm not, you know, I'm not, a functioning human being, and we're all in different stages of. Are any of us in college, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and then as soon as you think you got it all figured out, you sit down with your daughter with a therapist, and you know at the end of it's it's supposed to be an hour, by the way, it was two hours, and I was just like this weeping mass of humanity at the end of it, recognizing on many levels. I had totally screwed up. There were so many things wrong with me. I got out of that meeting thinking, oh my God, you know, what have I been doing all these years? I thought I had my act together. And, and you know, yeah, to some level I do, but I've also messed up in so many different ways. Sure. Being comfortable with that, I think, is also part of the mind. Uh, yeah, comfortable with making mistakes is, and owning up to it and not yeah. beating yourself up because of it. That, that's yeah. part of it so that you can survive, right? So that you don't right. commit suicide or, or, or be paralyzed in moving forward. Because at the end of the day, we have to keep moving forward and do the things 
like the next day, like in our world, you have to trade. And if you're going to trade, you have to ask questions and be in somebody else's head. <laughs> so you don't have time to worry about a lot of that stuff. You have to be able to segregate. And that does take maturity. It does take going through probably a lot in your life and a lot of self-reflection and maybe drugs. I don't know. Maybe drugs are I'm, I'm kind of joking, um, but because it hasn't really worked for me, you know, in terms of any of, of, of that, I would think that would probably be a distraction. But in saying without the most, it is like, it, it's an uh, it, it's an anesthetic and it's an emotional. Um, what's the word I want to use? Um, it, it just you remove yourself from reality. OK. And that. that's probably, yeah, it's a, it's a bad thing. For Ooh, the most yeah. part, I, I I've seen different things happen, but for the most part, it, it's a removal uh, and a, almost a, sequestra a sequestration of self in the drug use, right? Because you, you just pull back and, and you're in your own head and you're feeling good and you don't care about anything else when, when it's the opposite that really needs to be happening. Now, I think, I think food and, and, and is a, is a great, a, a way of getting together with people and being a foodie. If you're not a foodie, then I guess that's really hard, but being a foodie and loving, I love every food, mm. you know, it's, it's a great connector for me. And also I, I do think that getting high, whether it's through alcohol or drugs with people um, and breaking down barriers on all sides and having a way of being able to do that, that's safe. Right. You know, is a good thing or can be a good thing. And it's certainly been very helpful for me and in, in my life, especially in the Japanese culture where they're very usually closed on a lot of things. But if after the second or third place, you're now having a, an honest conversation that you're not gonna talk about tomorrow. That's kind of the culture is uh, we're so drunk we're now right down to the bare bones of who we are and what we really believe. Let's lay it into each other. Let's talk about it. Tomorrow, we're not going to remember this. We're not going to talk about it, but we're going to lay it out. I think it's a very inefficient way of doing work. <laughs> you know? But if it comes down to that, hey, I'll do whatever it takes. Well, and on a sensory level, there is a shift that takes place because now you feel like you've opened up and you've become more vulnerable with each other. And that does tend to move a relationship, at least inch it forward a little bit. Yeah. Now, what, um, if you could, what do you find are the, the essence or the, the best practice that you could advise others, especially now, in how to progress into the ne this next phase of our global growth. Got it. Yeah, one of the words in the last few weeks that I've really been hung up on uh, is the word impatient. So we do events about women in global leadership and each one of them is really inspiring and women and men together talk about progress that's being made. And I've seen a lot of progress personally for women in the world. Uh, when I started in Korea, for instance, women were not allowed to do business, you know, 35 years ago, it just wasn't allowed. And now, you know, it's, it is allowed. So things like that have progressed. However, still, there's not equality. Still, we pick out people with, you know, problems, quote unquote, problems and differences. And, you know, it's just, you know, why can't we make more progress faster? And so I'm, I'm very much into what Martha, Dr. Martin Luther King talked about when he was in prison. And he talked about, I'm less worried about the real crazy people. I'm much more worried about the people who seem like they're decent. And but then they say, things that will happen in their time. Well, it's okay. No, I, I'm not happy with that. I don't like the fact that there are people like that in the world. I'm disappointed in that. I want to be impatient. I want to do it politely and respectfully. And But I also want to make faster progress because it's not fair for women or people with that are different that we're still allowing this to happen in society, not just in the U.S., by the way, but around the world. 
Absolutely. You know, it happens everywhere. It's not a U.S. phenomenon. It's a human phenomenon. We always have to pick somebody who's lesser than us so that we elevate ourselves above them, right? It's crazy. We have to make faster progress. And so maybe this is more for the enlightened people in the audience is let's all be impatient. You know, let's keep putting pressure on others who have power to say, I'm, we can't keep waiting. It's not right because our children and our children's children need to live in a much better world. Education is a great place where certainly all of us know what happens in, in schools in the U.S. where kids bully each other and have it, and it's still happening. How could that be? It's so disappointing to me that being a 63-year-old man and thinking back, you know, whatever that was, 40, 50 years, that we still haven't really made fundamental progress on that. And there's still people arguing that we, we should can maintain or go back to some greater time in the past. Nothing should be backward. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Everything should be forward. Everything should be impatient on let's move forward. And so, so I'm not sure if that answered your question fully, but the, the word impatient really has stuck with me because at the end of these meetings, when the women get, say, well, you know, yes, we've made a lot of progress. That's great. And I, I jump in and say, great, let's keep making a lot more. Let's be impatient with this. And it takes the people that are the white guys in our society or the people in power in Pakistan or in China or in any country, the people that have the power have to give it up. They have to be empathetic for the people who don't have power to say, let's have justice, let's have fairness, let's have equity. That's a hard thing to do everywhere. I think we all need to be more impatient with that. Thank you. Uh, that was perfectly said. And, and in respect of that, the power is actually in the people to move through their local systems and put the leadership in place that needs to be there. And we've acquiesced our power or we've acquiesced the, the ability to use our power and uh, to the trust that we've given in leadership that we thought would have had it. it and which we want to believe that people in leadership roles are actually doing things for the betterment of us. And we found out throughout the world, that's not what happens. It's the money and the power that is, ends up controlling everything. And that's what in the impatient side, that's where we need to rise collectively and figure out a way to work within the systems to make that change happen. Look at President Zelensky in Ukraine, the integrity and the leadership He's first bribed by the Trump administration. They try to get him to do whatever. He actually, Putin had tried to bribe him ahead of that. When he got elected, Putin tried to bribe him and he realized he couldn't. Trump tried to bribe him. It's like, do this stuff for me as a favor and I'm going to hold your missiles back and all. He wouldn't do it. He had the integrity to say no. Now it's all Putin thinking, oh, okay, I can just have this guy leave the country. I'll just put a little pressure on him and he'll could just go somewhere and be comfortable with some money. Hell yeah, no. I, I think it's a lot more complex than that. Um, and, and I have some, you know, having a Russian wife, she's a lot more aware of the history there. And, and so we've done a little more. Don't disagree that the possibility of what you're saying is actually true. Uh, but there's more, right? And, and because there, there's a lot of history in how things have moved forward and, and in my opinion how uh, for lack of a better the i'll use the globalist term they've used the aspects of democracy insidiously in order to move their agenda of forward and and that's happened without much awareness which is different now because now with this uh, multiple eyes in the net and, and news and, and things being readily available and, and people with actual experience that, that are in places that are sharing what's going on. There seems to be a different reality that we still aren't really fully aware of. Don't know that we'll ever be. And yeah, well, so we I, don't think, I don't think it's that complicated. I think it is 
a fundamental human uh, value to have the ability to to educate your children, to have them have a better Absolutely. life. Absolutely, to I'm in total bombed, agreement with that. I was speaking to, to the- not, get, not be attacked. And it's also a fundamental historical fact that people like Putin thought that they could just buy people off, like the guy in Belarus, right? That guy's bought and sold because he's comfortable and all. My my uncle in um, outside of Stuttgart, he owned the hotel in a place called Brockenheim. Um, and, and Hitler and his henchmen basically put enough pressure on him that to say, look, unless you kind of play along, you're, you're not going to have a family. And it wasn't always talked about explicitly, right? But it was well understood by people. This, is, this has been going on for all of history. So Zelensky mm -hmm. comes along. He's going to die if he takes the stand, but he hasn't yet. He may still. But he's been able to stand up to this. And we all admire it. So it's a human value sure. that whether it's in Taiwan, whether it's in the U.S., in Cleveland, whether it's in Latvia, Lithuania, one of the amazing things that really inspired me about John McCain was after he died, like a month or two after he died, I was able to interview the Lithuanian ambassador to, to the U.S. You know, here in, in Scottsdale. And he went on and on about how amazing John McCain was in their pursuit of freedom for their country. John McCain was their advocate and he kept advocating for them to be able to live a free life, just the basics, right? Be able to educate your children, et cetera. And they, they had already renamed several buildings in Lithuania after John McCain because of his leadership in getting people to support just their ability to live a life. So I, right. I mean, I, I appreciate that there are other factors and I've read a bunch of articles about, you know, the history of the Orthodox Church and all that. To a large extent, I think that's way over complicating things. It doesn't get more complicated that, look, we want to have a life, we want to have an impact, and that impact may be just making sure we have children that have a better life than us, or if we're lucky enough and blessed enough and genetically blessed enough, maybe we can have a bigger impact than just having children that have a better life. We can impact others. And I, and I hope, and I, I hope to be in that position. I, I think I, I have the ability to do it. I have to put pressure on myself to continue to get better at that. And you have that in yourself. You have the ability above and beyond just creating children that have a better life, you've got the ability to impact people in a bigger, broader way. And I, I think that's awesome. And it's certainly something I think about every day. How do we get better at that? Yeah, yeah, a, a daily question. And then answering that question with being better every day. And part of it is being inspirational like Zelensky, how he can sit there and, and, and basically say, look, you know, I'm not going anywhere. We're going to defend our country. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to take the plane. I don't need, I don't need anything other than a bulletproof vest. I need, I need these things. And that's something that has inspired the world. And, and I love the fact that that's happened because it reminds us that we're a human race, yeah. that we have fundamental connections with each other that, that transcend borders. And we all need to have that fundamental connection and transcend borders because we are one planet and one people. So, Doug, I really appreciate your time and, and your answers and the exploration we went through in, in the, the <laughs> trade realms. And it was really enjoyable for me, not the typical show for me, but it, I think, is much really practical and pragmatic because it brings that the idea of trade and what it really means and how it's done that actually benefits the world. So I thank you for that. I appreciate that. The, what I tell people is that if you're not, if you, if you can't do tr trade, you won't stick to it. You'll be spit out by the system. You have to be honest. You have to be capable. You have to be professional. There are certain things involved with that. So it goes back to what you and I talked about at the beginning. How do we create better behavior? in people and and creating that better behavior where we can kind of all get along trade is one way to do it there are many other ways to do it but it's certainly one way and so if i would suggest if any of you in the audience are have an interest in business 
and are interested and have those kinds of characteristics and interests, you know, get involved. And, and I think you're not just hopefully uh, be uh, advance your own wealth and your own well-being, but also uh, move the world forward as well. So I, I appreciate Zen, the, uh, the opportunity to, to, to speak my mind and to give my thoughts right or wrong on kind of how, how we see things and hopefully together in our different ways, we can move the world forward. Absolutely. And thank you again, Doug. And namaste and in la catch. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel. And as always, I will see you next time.